I invite you now to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Ruth, chapter 4, as we conclude our series today on this very enchanting book at a time in the history of Israel that was very turbulent, very unsettled. Ruth chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and when he went in to her, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative and may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. So the neighbor women gave him a name saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nation, and Nation begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. Today we come to the conclusion of this beautiful and unblemished short story called the Book of Ruth. Once again, it's important 
to remind ourselves that this intimate account of a righteous romance, and that's what it was, a righteous romance, is set against the backdrop of the unfaithful, unruly, and rowdy period of the judges. Remember, this was the time before Israel had any king when every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Sounds like America today, I know. That we, as Christians, should find this inspiring in the year 2022 when all of society is unraveling before us with lightning speed. Now let's remind ourselves that Naomi, Ruth, Boaz were not isolated in a sterile bubble, shielded from the prevailing norms of corruption in the society around them. The loose attitudes, the declining morals, and the temptations to sin and sin were all very much present then as today. What protection Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz did have came from a very unusual source in terms of our thinking today. Their protection came from a healthy fear of the Lord and an unabashed, unashamed commitment to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God that in due time, God would lift them up. Come what may, they quietly submitted to God in all of the details of their lives so that no matter what the odds, they were rewarded for their trust and obedience to God. They, all three characters, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, manifest the truth of Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence and his children shall have a place of refuge. Did you hear that? In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. If we ever lived in a day that is undermining us on every point, whether it's economic, government, uh, whether it is social, whether it is moral, we feel like we're being having the rug pulled out from us. But in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. And that's what we need to remember. We don't need to fear man. We don't need to fear government. We don't need to fear the economy collapsing. What we need to fear is God Almighty. And he has the power and authority. As I was reminded this morning at uh, 6 o'clock when those massive thunderclaps happened here. Don't know about your house, but they did here. And I never heard thunder like that in my life. But in chapter four, we pick up where we left off, you see. Boaz has privately agreed to perform the role of kinsman redeemer with the proviso that he first go to the near kinsman, a closer relative, and make the option available to him. Now, as expected, Boaz wasted no time in the matter of getting to the town gate. He was there by first light, you can be sure. This large space, uh, open space between the city's outer wall and the inner wall served much as a county courthouse. Things happened at the gate. It was the place where trials were administered, where hearings were held, and other legal matters were officially handled. What's remarkable is that Boaz no sooner arrived at the gate than the very relative in question just happened by at the same time. Now, as you know, one of the themes, a central theme to the book of Ruth is God's providence. God is out there. He's working on the behalf of his, of his people and he's never too early and he's never too late. He's always on time. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know anything else. Again, we see the virtue of waiting on the Lord rather than taking things into our own hands and running ahead of the Lord which I've often done and have lived to regret. With this near relative at hand now, Boaz invites him to sit down along the small alcove, along the walls, away from the noisy foot traffic of the street. Then he flagged down 12 elders to form a sort of town council, and he had them sit down as witnesses of the forthcoming legal transaction. Now Boaz went straight to the point. He was a man of integrity and he informed this nearer relative, it's like this, 
Naomi's back from Moab, and she's selling the property that belonged to her husband, Elimelech. I thought it right to bring it to your attention and suggest that you buy it or redeem it. If you do, fine. But if you won't, then tell me, and I will. Because you get first dibs, then I'm next in line. Simple, straightforward. This was no trivial matter, by the way, because this piece of property was not free to be purchased by just anybody who came along with the cash in their hand. It first had to be offered to family, kinsmen, that they might redeem it before being offered to any outsider for sale. Since, given her age, Naomi was not likely to have any more children, any more sons, to claim the property, it would become this kinsman redeemer's free and clear upon his purchase. So this unnamed man understandably decided to do his duty as kinsman redeemer. He felt he had everything to gain and nothing to lose. At that point, you would expect Boaz to become very angry. Boaz's hopes appear to be crushed. But he was not only a man of faith, he was a savvy businessman. That was very clear from the beginning when he was introduced. And he clarified the matter. He said, now, kinsman redeemer has a dual responsibility. One is to purchase the land of the deceased relative, and then he must also marry the deceased relative's widow and raise up an heir to claim legitimate ownership of the property in the year of Jubilee when everything reverted to the original owner. The man may have assumed that he would be marrying Naomi, and Naomi would have no more children. But Naomi had conceded her right to Ruth, and Ruth was young enough to still have children, a son, an heir, and come to find out that's exactly what happened. She did indeed give birth to a son. But to this man, that wasn't all clear. Now he sensed the arrangement would jeopardize his own estate. So he waived his responsibility and Boaz gladly assumed it. Now at that point, get this, the custom according to Deuteronomy, according to the law, was that the widow, in this case Naomi or Ruth, should remove the sandal of the unnamed man and spit in his face. I'm not sure how that would go over in the courthouse today. Why? Because he had refused to perform a sacred responsibility of perpetuating the memory, the name, and the inheritance of a deceased brother. The Bible says anyone who fails to take care of a member of his own household has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Do you know of someone who's in your family who's aged? Who doesn't have the financial needs and ability to meet their own needs? That's whom God calls us to respond to. However, in this particular case, to avoid any shame, the man willingly took off his sandal, handed it over to Boaz, and voila, the entire transaction was now officially legalized. Boaz immediately became the legal purchaser of the property belonging to Elimelech, Melon, and Chilion, and more importantly, he was free to take Ruth as his wife and publicly announced, announced his decision to do that right on that very spot. 
at the gate. Now let's stop here and say something that uh, all these details may seem together rather te tedious to the average person who is reading this short story, this short romance, for the first time, perhaps without realizing that it actually comes from the Bible, that it's an inspired word of God. After all, in a day when two people uh, meet each other and shortly thereafter casually decide to jump in bed together with no, little or no thought about anyone else or their responsibilities, all these fine legal details are a bit hard to digest, aren't they? However, whenever a society shows contempt for process, they also show contempt for order. And when they show contempt for order, they show contempt for God because God is a God of order. Think of it. He created the world out there in six days in an orderly progression. God ordained marriage, and marriage involves order, formal commitment, and responsibility. To ignore any or all of those things is to forfeit a blessed marriage, since it is the fundamental unit or building block of the society. God puts a perimeter around it, and he says, don't touch. Don't mess with this. What is the movement in America? Behind homosexuality, behind transgender and all of the other deviations, it's simply this, to destroy the family. To destroy the definition of the family as one man and one woman coming together for one lifetime and having children to be fruitful and multiply. When you mess with that, be ready. Because God is sending his judgment on America in a way like never before. We're seeing it in terms of natural disasters. We're seeing it in terms of economic disasters. We are seeing it in shameful leadership in our own country. And we are seeing it in military and national threats to our national security. God is bringing his judgment on a nation that has tampered with something that is exclusively holy. And it will pay the price. Mark it down. It will pay the price. Now, Boaz is a model for us. He's a model of serious and sincere thinking when it comes to the marriage covenant. He doesn't take it lightly. And when a minister stands in front of pe two people who are preparing to get, to get married, he says, marriage is not to be entered into lightly, but soberly, seriously, and in the fear of God. You take away that fear of God, and anything can happen. And it will. Watch it. But he declared a public commitment to marry Ruth, Melon's widow, in order to maintain that man's name and dignity and connection with his property. Now that was the legal reason, but that wasn't the only, nor was it the primary reason that Boaz stepped up to the plate. He feared God, and he loved Ruth, and he was aware of her reputation as a woman of noble character. Hence, here is a man willing to build up the house of his kinsman, of his brother. Here's an example of Christ's selfless love for impoverished sinners. Unlike Ruth, we do not have a noble character. We do not have a noble reputation before God. We are all unclean. We are all unfit. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And until we get that into our heads as a nation, we will continue to walk away from God. We will continue to thumb our nose at him. Unlike Ruth, we are sinners. We are in bondage to sin. We are enslaved by it. We are miserable. 
Yet here's what happens. Jesus Christ qualifies us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now there's no wasted words there. Jesus Christ, said Paul to the Colossians, we read it earlier, qualifies us to be partakers of the inheritance. See, that was what was at stake, the inheritance of the saints in light. Think of it like this. Here's Satan's kingdom, and here's Christ's kingdom. Satan's kingdom is one of darkness. It's one of total absence of light, absence of warmth, absence of joy. Satan uses the darkness to blind human beings to their condition and to the truth uh, and uh, that we might be saved. It's as simple as that. And each one of us is held a prisoner there until we appeal to Jesus Christ as our kinsman redeemer, you see. Now over here you have the kingdom of Christ. It's a kingdom of light. It's a kingdom of truth. It's a kingdom of love. It's a kingdom of joy and peace. And the way that you enter into that kingdom is through the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross, that's where your peace comes from. It comes from nothing you do, it comes from nothing you inherit, it comes from nothing you accomplish, nothing you achieve. Not to diminish any of those things, but it doesn't come from those things. It comes exclusively to you through the merits of Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, who died as the Lamb of God on the cross for your sin. He took your place for every sin. You were born in sin. In sin, your mother conceived you. And ever since that day, you grew and you practiced sin until you came to Christ. Now think of it like this. Uh, Jesus says, I'll be your kinsman redeemer. Yes, but first, I have to take care of some legal business. There's this matter of God's law and that has to be honored above everything else. That has to be our first consideration. Are we really honoring God? Or are we attempting to cleverly skirt the issue and get around it? Sinner, you broke it. You violated it. And Jesus says there are 10 witnesses who will testify against you right now. Listen, listen to what they're saying. One, you shall have no other gods before me. Two, you shall not make any idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You will remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. You will honor your father and your mother. You will not kill, kill. You will not commit adultery. You will not steal, you will not bear false witness, and you will not covet. These are against you. They're the witnesses. The sinner's kinsman redeemer says, before I can become your kinsman redeemer, I need to come down and take care of these matters, lest you hear the accusations for all eternity in hell. I'll be born in Bethlehem, where Naomi Ruth and Boaz lived. I'll be taken to Golgotha outside the city walls and I'll be crucified. I'll become the sacrifice for your sin. Then I'll die, I'll be placed in a tomb and the third day I will rise again and I'll ascend back to heaven and justify all who believe in me and call upon my name for salvation. So that Paul could go to the Romans, he could write to the Romans and he said, Christ is the end of the law. It leads to him and its purpose is fulfilled in him for granting righteousness to everyone who believes. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Remember, his is the kingdom of light. Satan's is the kingdom of dark. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
Whoever follows me is translated, is transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, along with all of the saints, to receive the inheritance. There can be no greater inspiration to love and to the romance between Christ and his church, Christ the kinsman redeemer and his church, than to know of his kindness. He didn't have to go there. He didn't have to die. He told Peter when Peter took out that sword and slashed off the ear of Malchus, the high priest servant, he says, put, put, put away the sword now. Don't you think that if I really wanted to, I could call upon my, hev my heavenly father and that he would send 12 legions of angels to come and destroy the world? But the Bible says, though he was rich, Yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. Christ loved the church, you see, and he gave himself for them. Now this love between the bride and the bridegroom, as you would expect, allows for the birth of children. Just as Boaz and Ruth were then married and they gave birth to the son Obed and the women and the elders of Bethlehem, uh, their prayer for the couple was that uh, you might be as Rachel and Leah, you know, uh, the competition that they had that resulted in the 12 tribes of Israel. And like the family of Perez, the son of Tamar, born to her father-in-law Judah who found the leading clan of Judah to which Boaz belonged. What stands out, what is, what is incredibly amazing, if not bizarre, is that Ruth and Tamar were both Gentiles who took daring steps to continue the family line and both ended up belonging to the lineage that connects David with Abraham and then connects them with our Lord. Read Matthew 1. And the great opportunity and the challenge of the church in this third millennium is to be fruitful and multiply. But as is the case of Boaz and Ruth, they came together as husband and wife, but the author makes it very clear. Notice what he says, that the Lord allowed Ruth to conceive. Now as the church, we have to think that through. What really is it that makes the church fruitful and multiply? Is it really the building? Is it really the grounds? Is it really the entertaining pastor or the entertaining music? Is it really the programs? I mean, are these things really what actually produces a conversion of a person's soul? And the answer is no. They can't possibly do that. The only person that can affect the transformation of the soul from sinner to saint is the Holy Spirit. We won't see people, especially young people, come to Christ unless, unless we are willing to do the hard work of travailing in prayer. Jonah, you'll remember, in the mouth of the whale said, salvation is of the Lord. We can't rely on church buildings, parking lots, spacious property, great music, or being next to a country club to be the substitute for earnest prayer for the salvation of lost souls on their way to hell. You know what Jesus said in, six, in John 6, 44? He said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day are we knocking at the door of the father 
Father, please, let this sinner in. Interceding, interceding with crying, with tears, with agony, because we know that we have members of our own family or our extended family or our friends, our relatives who are on their way to hell. They have not, with all of what's exposed, what's available to them in the world, the Bibles, the religious television, the religious uh, radio, the tapes, the book, all of it has meant nothing. They're still on their way to hell because they have not received the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And that should create what the Bible says is a burden. You see, whenever the prophets came with their message, they said, the burden of the Lord given to thus prophet. Well, listen to the prayers of devout men who had a burden for the lost. They're one sentence prayers. John Knox, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. John Hyde or praying Hyde, Father, give me these souls meaning these children that he often dealt with, or I die. Samuel Hadley, about New York City many years ago. God, the sin in this city is breaking my heart. George Whitfield, Lord, give me souls or take my soul. If I'm going to be just here and living but not interacting on the benefit of souls for eternity. There's no point in me staying around. J.O. Fraser, the missionary to the Lasai people of China said, give me Lasai converts and I can truly say, I will be happy even in a pigsty. David Livingston, I must open a way to the interior of Africa or perish. And finally, General William Booth. I'm very tired, but I must go on. A fire is in my bones. Oh God, what can I say? Souls, souls, souls. My heart hungers for souls. Remember William Carey, the father of called the Father of Modern Missions. He served in India for many, uh, many years, and he gradually became concerned about the attitude of his son, Felix, William Carey's son, Felix. Felix had, be, had promised um, to become a missionary. Yeah, a Christian missionary. But he reneged on that promise, that vow, when he was appointed ambassador to Burma by the Queen of England. And Carey then wrote to a friend asking him to pray for his son with these words, pray for Felix. He has degenerated into an ambassador of the British government when he should be serving the King of Kings. I don't know. This rich romance between Boaz and Ruth concludes with the women of Bethlehem saying, Naomi has a son. Well, it wasn't really Naomi's son. Uh, it was Boaz and Ruth's son. They had the son. And uh, the, the, these women were the ones uh, in the town who named him. They actually named uh, Ruth and Boaz's child, Obed, meaning one who works or serves. Isn't that interesting? It anticipates the child's service for Naomi in her golden years when she isn't able to do for herself. The child signifies that now Naomi has come full circle. Remember, she originally left Judah during a famine for Moab full, but she returned empty. She returned without her husband and without her two sons. All three of them died while they were down in Moab due to the famine. And so she returned and they were calling her Naomi. She said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, 
Mara means bitter. But now, now there has been a happy reversal. And she can go back to her original name. Naomi means my pleasant one. Earlier she blamed God for her tragic life circumstances. But her newborn son has restored her from empty to full, from bitter to now the joyous, pleasant one. May I ask you today, has that happened to you? As Boaz and Ruth were come brought together by the providential working of God, by the pure grace of God, so God is seeking to bring you together with Jesus Christ. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. This Obed turned out to be the grandfather of King David. In David's line came Jesus Christ, the ultimate kinsman redeemer par excellence. He descended from God to redeem you. All the way across the centuries, all the way across the millenniums, right up to August 21st, 2022. We've all known someone, somewhere, who's had a reversal, a family, a financial or health reversal. It's sad, we know that. We prayed for them. But where he is welcome, Jesus Christ ultimately only brings a happy reversal. He takes you from that kingdom of darkness that belongs to Satan into the kingdom of light. He takes you from poverty. He takes you to riches. He takes you to ultimate and eternal sorrow, to ultimate and eternal joy. Do you know of someone this morning that you can think of who, who just seems to be destined for disappointment, destined for disgrace, destined for defeat, destined for eternal death? Whatever you face or they face, to put our trust alone in our kinsman redeemer, like Ruth invested everything in Boaz and committed everything to him. He worked out the details right down to the final and finest print. He worked out every detail. Will you, will you commit yourself? Or will you commit this person you're praying for? Will you commit them to right down to the finest details, the fine print? Will you commit them to Christ as his, as their kinsman redeemer? an experience of the everlasting glory of God. That's our privilege. That's our calling as the church. Only one question. Have you met the kinsman redeemer?